This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 70. Welcome to the 70th episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. So one of the most common questions that I get from my listeners and from the readers of my blog is how long will it take for my period to come back after coming off of the pill or other hormonal contraceptives? So I decided to create an awesome resource that tackles this tough question, and it's free when you sign up for the Fertility Friday newsletter. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash ebook to get your free copy of my new ebook, Where the Is My Period? Five Steps to Restore Your Menstrual Health and Fertility After Going Off the Pill, where I reveal what to expect when you come off of hormonal contraceptives, and I share five steps to restoring healthy menstrual cycles post-pill. So I did take a little bit of a risk with the title, but I wanted to express the sheer frustration that I feel from my listeners and readers when they come off of the pill only to find that their menstrual cycles are a mess. So my ebook provides a bit of a roadmap and gives some insight as to why your period didn't just bounce back the second that you stopped taking the hormones. And if you've been enjoying the show, I would love it if you take a moment and leave a review and a rating on iTunes. It helps the show to move up in rankings so that more people can find it. And of course, I'd like to say a special thank you to all the listeners who've left reviews already. I read all of your reviews and I really appreciate you taking the time to let me know how I'm doing. And in today's show, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Dr. Thomas Cowan. Dr. Cowan is a medical doctor who graduated from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine in 1984. He is a founding member of the Weston A. Price Foundation and the principal author of the book, The Fourfold Path to Healing. He is the co-author of the book, The Nourishing Traditions Book of Baby and Child Care, together with Sally Fallon Morrell. And he writes the Ask the Doctor column in Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts, which is the foundation's quarterly magazine. He has lectured throughout the United States and Canada and currently sees patients out of his office in San Francisco. And in today's show, we'll be talking about nutrition for preconception, pregnancy, nutrition for children and babies, babies and children as they grow up. And we'll also be talking about illness and how we look at it in our medical, in our current Western medical society. And so without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Cowan. Thank you. Um, Well, thank you for being here today. And so I did give you a bit of an introduction, but I I would like to, I would love to hear a little bit about how you found yourself in kind of the holistic nutritional field of medicine. Well, it's kind of an odd story because I I would, the, the way I would put it is I was sort of groomed from early on to be a doctor, meaning my my father and grandfather were actually dentists, and most of their friends were doctors, and so I grew up in an environment of a lot of doctors, and because I did well in school, that was sort of assumed. But uh, for me, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think they knew anything, and I, I just didn't like it. I didn't know why exactly, but I didn't like it. So I tried to do anything I could to get out of it, and I ended up going to the Peace Corps as soon as I graduated from from college, which I didn't like either. And I went there to teach gardening, basically, which I didn't know much about. But anyways, um, and while I was in the Peace Corps in southern Africa, a place called Swaziland, <clears throat> I was actually given a books and information about how how to do biodynamic farming, which is basically anthroposophical uh, gardening. And I was given nurse, I was given nutrition and physical degeneration by Weston Price in Swaziland. And I, I still contend that I'm probably the only person on earth who met anthroposophy and um, the work of Weston Price in Swaziland. I I think that's a fair statement. And so basically, because I had not much else to do there in Swaziland, I read everything I could on anthroposophy and nutrition, and I realized that the medicine that I was not interested in doing was because the medicine wasn't correct. So that led me to think, well, maybe I could and should do medicine, 
So then I decided to get my ducks in a row to go to medical school, which I did all the time knowing that I wanted to um, pursue food as medicine and some sort of, you know, natural kind of healing technique. Okay, and for the listeners who aren't familiar, and I'm not even too familiar, what is anthrop- anthropophysy? So anthropophysy means wisdom of man, which is a pretty lofty uh, word, but it started it was started by a fellow named Rudolf Steiner in the uh, early part of the 20th century. Rudolf Steiner also started Waldorf schools. He actually wrote the curriculum. And the Waldorf schools are the second largest private school movement in the world. He also uh, gave the recipe, the directions, the information for biodynamic gardening, which is probably the most widely used, uh, you know, organic plus gardening method in the world now. I think something like 15 or 20 percent of the vineyards in Europe grow their grapes biodynamically. He also started anthroposophical medicine, which is probably the most successful natural healing technique, especially in Europe. There's even a public hospital in Germany where all the doctors, the surgeons and the ophthalmologists and the family doctors all have to be trained in anthroposophy. Uh, And that's not even his main job. Uh, He was a philosopher and a student of, uh, he studied Goethe, and he was a sculptor and a painter and a bunch of other things. So he was, he was a, he was a very interesting, to put it mildly, fellow who knew a lot of things. And so he gave, you know, gave out of his, Insights, he founded these different ways of, of practical application. And so to this day, there's a training in anthroposophical medicine, which, I mean, I'm, I'm qualified as an, and certified as an anthroposophical doctor, but it, it's only a kind of peripheral thing that I do at this point. Okay. One of the things that I really loved about the book Nourishing Traditions um, and, you know, I hadn't, I have not had a chance to, to f- read the book, your, your book, um, The Fourfold Path to Healing. Um, but what I really love about it is that it, it relies on the traditional wisdom, you know, the work of Dr. Weston Price. And so, you know, maybe we could start by talking a little bit about what your philosophy kind of is around illness and healing and how it differs from that of mainstream medicine. Well, the, the simplest way I can explain it is, which I have said in, I don't know how many lectures and how many different patients, probably if my wife heard me say it one more time, she'll probably scream, but <clears throat> I, I often tell people the job of a doctor is to distinguish the therapy from the disease and not confuse the two. And what I mean by that is, is a best <clears throat> explained by a very simple example of the splinter in the in your finger. So let's say you get a splinter in your finger, and then the next thing that happens if you don't take the splinter out is you get you form pus around the splinter. <clears throat> now the first question to ask oneself is: Is that pus? Is that a disease, meaning an infection, or is that the therapy, meaning it's trying to? heal something, meaning it's trying to get the splinter out. Now, in a simple example like that, I think most <clears throat> reasonable people would say the, the pus is the therapy for the splinter. And you can always tell if you're, if you're making a mistake, because if you make the mistake of saying the pus is the disease, and then you leave the splinter and say, treat the person with an antibiotic because, after all, they have an infection, then the pus will go away, and then it'll come back. And then it'll go away and come back, and you end up having a chronic disease, and eventually the body will wall off the splinter, and you'll have a what's called a tumor, which just means a new growth, 
doesn't mean cancer, but you'll have a, a growth around the around the splinter because the body is essentially sick of you trying to stop the therapy. So the obvious solution is the splinter is the disease. You take the splinter out, and then miraculously the pus goes away. Now, <clears throat> one would think that doctors, obviously, you know, as smart as they are and as well-trained, wouldn't make that mistake. But the reality is they make that mistake every single day, almost every one of them. So here's another example. A uh, 50-year-old man smokes, which is sort of like putting splinters in your lungs. So he puts splinters in his lungs, and then he gets a cough and a fever and mucus, which is the same as the pus, trying to get the splinters out of his lungs. And he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, Aha, you have bronchitis, you have to take this antibiotic. So what's happening is he's confused between the therapy and the disease. He's saying that this therapeutic attempt by the body is actually a disease, when in fact it's the response. And so that happens twice a year for 20 years. That's sort of average for smokers getting bronchitis. And then they have a bag of splinters in their lungs. And I know it's not quite this simple, but in some ways it is this simple. So then they have a bag of splinters in their lungs, and we call that a lung cancer. And then we say, I don't know why you got lung cancer. You probably smoked too much. Well, it is true that you probably did smoke too much. But the, the, the equally as important reason is every time your body tried to get the splinter out of your lungs, the smoke out of your lungs, it was thwarted by the doctor because of, I would say, institutional confusion. That thing, that happens basically every day. You get deposits in your joints, you make inflammation, you go to the doctor, he says the inflammation is the disease, when it's really the therapeutic attempt People write books on getting rid of inflammation when the inflammation is the, is the therapeutic attempt to get rid of stuff which doesn't belong there. And the bigger, the bigger thing behind this is when you go to medical school, something very interesting happens. Like you would think that we learn the role of microbes, microorganisms in nature. You know, that would be where you start if you're starting with infections. And what you would learn is that microbes are basically scavengers. They live on dead material in nature, and they recycle it. So you wouldn't go to a forest, and the trees fall down, and then the fungus and the bacteria eat the dead wood and recycle it into humus to provide food for the new trees. You wouldn't go to the forest and say, oh, that tree, that log has an infection. I mean, that's ridiculous. Nobody would do that. That's just part of the cycles of nature. Yet, in medical school, you never do that. You never have that discussion. You just talk day one, life cycle of the, of the bacteria. It's this. It forms a spore. You kill it with penicillin. Move on to the next one. There's no context. There's no wisdom. There's just a bunch of isolated details which forms no coherent picture, which leaves doctors unable to form a cohesive view of illness, which puts their patients in jeopardy. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty pro profound. And so in the work that you do, a big part of actually getting to the root of the problem is to address dietary concerns. And just the way people are eating what they're putting into their bodies. Is that right? Yeah. But I mean, th that is true. I spent a lot of time on diet. I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> what the work of Weston Price did, and I, I tell you, I, would encourage everybody who's really interested in either their own health or medicine in general. They have to ask themselves, themselves one very simple and basic question. 
and that is, is the, is the outcome, the health outcome of humans today the best that people have ever done? If it is, then we should keep doing what we're doing, you know, eating genetically modified stuff and sugar and processed food and sleeping with EMFs and all this kind of stuff having the financial system and everything that we do. On the other hand, if, it, which is what the conclusion that I come, came to years ago, almost 40 years ago, that the outcomes that we have are by no means normal human outcomes, that people who get the rules right, they basically live disease-free lives. They don't have cancer, they don't have diabetes, they don't have heart disease, they don't die prematurely of degenerative disease, hardly ever, and, and some of them basically not at all. <clears throat> and if that's the case, anybody in a, you know, with any sense would say to themselves, well, how do they do that? What do they do? What do when do they sleep? When do they... You know, what do they eat? How often do they move their bodies? Whatever. You know, how, how many hours do they work? So once you start asking those things, you, you end up thinking, first of all, the diet is, is basically nourishing traditions, Western price diet. And you end up thinking there's a whole different way of living, which is, I would call, normal for human beings, and that the way we're living now is a radical departure from the way human beings were meant to live. And, I mean, I'm all for radical departures, but the radical departure of eating processed food and GMOs happens to not work very well. Well, it works for the medical profession because they make a lot of money off it, but it doesn't work for people who, for instance, want to get pregnant or want to have healthy lives. Well, maybe we could talk a little bit about um, kind of the way that some of these traditional cultures view pregnancy and how they actually um, prepare for pregnancy and just the consciousness around that period of time, you know, in a woman's life or in a couple's life. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I... It's not something, that particular question is not something I consider myself an expert on. But what, what I do know is that there's basically um, a couple things. One is that, is that the fat-soluble vitamins and fats in general, I mean, interestingly, the fats are what we make hormones out of, uh, particularly animal fats. Because if you look at a biochemistry chart, you make estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and uh, adrenal hormones, and, and also vitamin D, out of cholesterol. So if you want to stop making those and therefore have fertility you know, issues, the way to do that is to eat a vegan diet, which is why there are no successful human vegan cultures probably because they just died out before they had a chance to survive for many years. So, you know, so the, the animal part, I'm sorry, the fat part of a, of a preconception diet is crucial. So that includes the fats in general and the fat-soluble vitamins dissolved in the fats. So according to Price, there was no... Uh, example of traditional people without fertility problems who had low-fat diets or diets with low-fat soluble vitamins. That's a modern uh, intellectual conception which simply doesn't work. And the other thing that comes up is they typically had, you know, a kind of spacing practice which is based on you know, you're pregnant for a year, and then you nurse for a year, and then you recover for a year, and then you're ready to get pregnant again. And, you know, they had all kinds of cultural practices that enforced that. Um, and 
to keep people from having children sooner than that. And, and those are the two most important things. A diet that's based on <clears throat> liberal fats and high in fat-soluble vitamins, and then this kind of spacing practice. And then otherwise, because they were in such good health, they, you know, had almost no fertility issues. I'll tell you another thing is, you know, when people ask me all kinds of questions like, you know, even things that seem a little bit inappropriate, like what time should I go to bed or how, how many hours should I sleep, et cetera. And I tell people that knowing the habits of traditional people is like having the answers to the test before you get the test. Because what, what I know is that what they did worked. So, for instance, it worked even for fertility problems because, mm -hmm. as far as we know, they didn't really have fertility problems. So, you know, when did they go to bed? Well, they went to bed when the lights were out or when the, when the sun went down. And how long did they sleep? You know, it depended on the season, but sometimes up to 8 to 12 hours a day. Uh, here's another one. The average amount of work in a week, work meaning... Uh, activities that you do to maintain your livelihood, like making clothes and getting food and fixing your, your hut or house or whatever, was about 18 hours a week for men and 23 hours a week for women. So they didn't, you know, work themselves to the bone in front of a computer for 60 hours a week like we do. And if you talk about fertility problems, I would think those kind of things should come up. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course you touched on the diet, the importance of, you know, animal fats, uh, naturally occurring fats, obviously. Um, these traditional people didn't have like soybean oil and stuff. <laughs> um, right. And you mentioned that, you know, a, a vegan diet is one where you said, basically, if you wanted to reduce your hormone production, do that. So one of the, the ideas that I find really fascinating is that it, it doesn't really occur to people what the physical kind of building materials are to create a human being. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and why the diet does play a pretty found, foundational role in actually, you know, having a healthy baby. Uh, I mean, the simplest way to look at diet is we eat fats and proteins to build our structure and to create hormones and create and make enzymes. But primarily, fats and proteins are structure food. We eat carbohydrates for energy, and we eat uh, vegetables, minerals, phytochemicals, etc., as what we think of today as vitamins. So they provide, you know, special vitamins and minerals, et cetera. So, for instance, a, a lunch, which is common amongst particularly so-called educated, although I like to call them schooled, uh, women, is a big kale salad. So that's considered a healthy lunch by today's uh, educated slash school standards. But the reality is that's just the vitamin, mineral, phytochemical. Phytochemical just means plants have chemicals which do lots of important things, but in small amounts. And so whenever, when anybody ever asks me, you know, or if they're arguing for, um, for that a kale salad or Caesar salad, you know, as, as an, an appropriate healthy lunch or dinner. Uh, I often will, I have on my phone a photo of <clears throat> a guy named Buffalo Bull Backfat. His uh, portrait hangs in the Smithsonian, a uh, famous portrait of a Native American chief on the uh, Plains Indians. And he was apparently about in his 70s when they took this picture, and he looks like he's about 40. And he's a big, strong guy, and I, you know, hold up the picture and I say, I don't think buffalo bull back fat ate Caesar salad for lunch. <laughs> it's 
possible he did. I wasn't there, so I don't really know. But that's not... I'm not saying there's anything wrong with vegetables. In fact, I'm writing a whole book on how to eat vegetables uh, because it's a very important subject. But uh, So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with eating vegetables. But if you're eating vegetables to provide protein and fat, (laughs) that's not the way it works. People eat animal foods for protein and fat, they eat seed food for carbohydrates, and they eat vegetables like we would think of as vitamin pills. Okay. That's the traditional diet in a nutshell. Okay, and that's why um, that's why a vegan diet might not be optimal during uh, when you're trying to have a baby or when you're actually pregnant. Well, except I would get rid of the word might not. It's not. That's the vitamin part of the diet. And you're, you're mistakenly trying to get calories, fats, and proteins from vegetables, which is not, it's not the role of vegetables in a human diet. So if you're trying to build a body, uh, I mean, <laughs> Let, let me not, I'll try not to use a pejorative term. That's just crazy. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just not the way to do it. Okay. One of the, one of the areas, uh, one of the topics that I um, want to get into a little bit is, um, is our immune system and how it functions and why it's important for, for all of us, but especially for women who want to get pregnant to really try to improve their immune systems to improve the gut flora specifically one of the the main you know aspects in the nourishing traditions book of baby and child care is fermented foods it's throughout the book so when you're reading through the book the dietary recommendations of course include you know eating um, animal fats animal proteins uh, you know eggs i could go on but you know raw milk Um, but fermented foods plays a really big role in this diet. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how important or even why it's important for women to really be conscious of that um, when they're wanting to get pregnant, because it's one of those areas that just seems to be completely just absent when it comes to, I mean, other than take a probiotic, but it seems to be fairly absent in your typical mainstream advice for women who are wanting to get pregnant. Right. So, one of the occult causes or hidden causes of, of, of infertility, again, not that I'm an infertility specialist because I'm not, but one of, one of the reasons is autoimmune diseases, including endometriosis, which is not considered an autoimmune disease, but it is. Um, and and, and uh, an autoimmune disease is one again another example of the confusion in, that conventional medicine has in theory between the disease and the and the, the therapy and the disease. So with autoimmune disease, you have antibodies, and those antibodies target and destroy one of your tissues. So a common example is Hashimoto's, where you make thyroid antibodies. The thyroid antibodies destroy your tissue, your thyroid, and then you become hypothyroid. Now, the regular medicine targets two areas as the cause. Either in Hashimoto's, they target the thyroid. They say, your thyroid doesn't work well, so you take thyroid. But it's obvious that the, the problem is not your thyroid. The problem is you have an autoimmune, i.e. antibody attack against your thyroid. So in some other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, or lupus, which does cause infertility, they say it's the antibodies that are targeting your tissue, and that's the problem. The problem with that is antibodies are made because you have antigens in your blood. Uh, The antibodies are the response not the disease. They're the pus, not the splinter. And the reason I know that is because, again, whatever you're targeting the the therapy, not the disease, you can bet that what you're going to have is a chronic disease. 
because as soon as you stop getting rid of the antibodies, the whole thing will come back because you haven't addressed the reason why you make antibodies. So, to put it briefly, why do you make antibodies? Because you have antigens in your blood. So how do the antigens get into the blood? They get in through the gut because that's what the gut does is it keeps some antigens out and lets other ones get in. So what's wrong with the gut? Well, the gut is, is a muscle layer which is covered with a layer of five to seven pounds of bacteria, which we call the microbiome or the gut flora. And the way I describe it to people, it's like soil and grass. So you go to a prairie and you have a thick layer of soil and you have a nice grassy layer on top of it and everything's good. The grass is like the microbes, the, gut, the, the good bacteria that live in your gut. We have five to seven pounds. We have more microbes in our gut than we have human cells in our body. So it's a very important uh, part, of, part of us or even a question of what do you mean by us? Because from, from your skin in, there's more DNA of somebody else than there is of you. So that's sort of a metaphysical question. But anyways, so, but, so if you disturb the grass or the gut flora, then you expose the soil, which is the muscle layer of the intestines, and then you get erosion, and then stuff seeps into the groundwater. And that's the exact same thing that happens with us. If you don't have a good microbiome or gut bacteria, you expose the walls, they get eroded, meaning they form cracks, and then you get antigens, proteins absorbed into the bloodstream, which creates antibodies, which targets your tissue, which makes you infertile. So that's how it goes. So one of the obvious uh, ways of getting out of that is to replenish your gut flora, which, again, having the answers to the test, of meaning if you read Price you know, or Nourishing Traditions, you know that all traditional people ate good bacteria on a daily basis. That's how they preserve their food. And that was a daily replenishment of their gut flora. In fact, it's so important that the word that we use to describe how to make like sauerkraut, which is to culture it, is the same word that we use to describe how human beings form themselves into groups, meaning a culture. So, and it could be there's some wisdom of that because a culture is people who have similar gut flora. That's maybe stretching it a bit, but... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's sort of the origin of that. So in order to have to not have leaking proteins and all these autoimmune diseases which put your health and your fertility at risk, you have to have an effective barrier layer, and the barrier layer is the gut flora. Therefore, in order to do that, you have to eat sauerkraut, you know, kimchi, kefir, all that sort of fermented stuff, basically every day, and of course, the people who don't do that, which is like Americans, they have lots of autoimmune disease. The other reason is that <clears throat> the babies, uh, they're born, we, at least we think, with a sterile gut, uh, or at least in utero, they have a sterile gut, and then when they go through the birth canal, they are exposed to and swallow the bacteria that live in the mother's vagina and on her skin, and then they drink non-nutritive food for two or three days called colostrum. All mammals do it, and the reason for the colostrum is to uh, essentially give food and encouragement for the growth of the gut flora, not the person. So the baby loses weight, but the gut flora grows, and after two or three days, everything is good, and then you can eat real food, which is milk. So nature has made a priority to uh, get the gut flora first, and then you can eat. And the gut flora of the baby, essentially lifelong, is from the, uh, the quality of the, of the 
bacteria that live in the mother's vagina and on her skin. So I can hardly think of something more important than that to uh, bequeath one's child than that. Well, and I would love to talk a little bit about um, some of the, just because I I wanted to talk to you about the way that you uh, discuss illnesses and your philosophy on illness. I did do an interview with Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. It was very enlightening, as you can imagine. And, you know, she talked a lot about some of the the, the long list of illnesses that uh, what we call illnesses, you know, based on your philosophy, but the long list of illnesses basically that result from having um, messed up gut flora, for lack of a better word. And, you know, so for example, you know, children on the rise, they're getting asthma, allergies, eczema, all these different things that are related to gut flora. And, you know, based on the way that you described how medicine treats these illnesses, obviously you go to the doctor, you know, my kid has asthma and they give you an inhaler and then that treats, you know, the, the symptoms, but then it doesn't get rid of the asthma. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about illnesses and the relation to gut flora and why some of these conditions that we believe are incurable or chronic uh, actually can be resolved. Right. They're considered incurable or chronic because of the way they're treated. Uh, I mean, it's a great business model because then you get to treat somebody lifelong. But to think that a elimination from your skin, i.e. eczema, is a problem of the skin is, I mean, I don't know really the words to describe it except a childish, naive, and ludicrous. The reason there's eruptions from the skin is there's things in the blood that need to be eliminated. So the skin becomes kind of a backup excretory organ. So then you get into the same question. So wh- how do things get into the, into the blood that don't belong there and therefore need to be eliminated by the skin or cause inflammation in the lung? which we call asthma. You see, again, the doctors think that the primary cause of asthma is inflammation of the lung for whatever reason. But if you put, you know, infl- if you put proteins and make inflammatory reactions, you know, and create antibodies to absorb proteins, that can play itself out in the lungs or the skin or whatever. The inflammatory reaction is the way to eliminate things, not the primary disease. And the proof of that is if you get rid of the inflammation, does it solve the problem? Answer, no. It will make the problem worse. The problem will go away today, and then it will come back worse tomorrow because the old commercial said, you can't fool Mother Nature. So that's not how it works. So then you get to the question, like Natasha said, so why, does, why do these uh, reactions happen? They happen because there's a bad gut flora. There's, in, there's not a good condition of the intestines because of the way we eat and the way we live and the way we think, et cetera. And then you get breaches of the barrier, proteins get absorbed, antibodies get created, inflammatory reactions happen. Then you go to the doctor, and he is only concerned about getting rid of the inflammatory reactions, which is the last stage, not the first stage. And it never works. And if you don't believe me that it never works, go to the dermatologist and say, how many people have you cured of eczema with your cream?" And if he's, he or she is honest, the answer is zero. Yeah. Well, you know, as a, as a mother myself, one of the things that I often say, um, you know, as mothers, there's so much pressure on us to do everything perfect. And there's a lot of focus on, um, I mean, a lot of women are, are scared of labor specifically, or a lot of women are trying to eat really good during pregnancy. But Um, I always say like after labor, you know, labor has a beginning, middle and an end, and then you have a child. And given the way things are in our world today, a lot of children are, are, you know, born with 
anywhere from mild kind of, you know, like like eczema to varying other, you know, things that they have to go through. And of course, throughout childhood, children are exposed to different things. There's lots of different childhood illnesses and those types of things that children have to go through. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, because it, uh, the focus of my show, I, I often talk about how important it is to eat properly during pregnancy and p- to prepare. But let's talk about how important diet is for babies and children. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that. I mean, it's the same principles. It, if, you know, babies need uh, fats and proteins, a lot of them, in order to grow structure and to produce hormones and enzymes and all those sort of things. They need uh, carbohydrates for energy, and they need some vitamins, some fruits and vegetables for vitamins, minerals, etc. And they need things like broth and, you know, fermented foods for probiotics and structural proteins, etc. It's basically just nourishing traditions or the diet that we outlined in the baby book. I mean, if you don't do that and you feed them, you know, genetically modified processed food, no probiotic food, no cultured food, uh, you know, uh, you're going to end up with a sick child. I mean, it seems weird to me that if you eat in a way or live in a way that's not the human way, it's like feeding dolphins, you know, somebody thinks kale is a good food, which it is for some people, but not for dolphins. And so if you say, theory, kale is a good food, therefore we should feed all dolphins kale, you will have some very sick dolphins on your hands. Because that kind of diet, that American processed food diet, is not a human diet. It's not a for anybody diet or any animal, but it's certainly not a human baby diet. It's very simple. It's, you know, healthy fats and proteins from animal foods, seed food for carbohydrates and fiber, and vegetables and fruit. For uh, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and broth and fermented food. That's the diet. You do anything but that, and you're going to have sick children. And I mean, when it comes to breastfeeding, I think the message, even the message that I was directly told from my own doctor, was that, you know, the baby will always get what the baby needs. Um, even in terms of during pregnancy, the baby will always get what the baby needs. Um, and you don't really have to worry too much about that. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, after you've had the baby and, and breastfeeding versus formula, perhaps you could talk a little bit about, the, you know, breastfeeding versus formula. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the interesting things in, in the book is that there's recipes for homemade formula. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about the differences there. Well, this idea that doesn't matter what the mother eats, the baby will get everything they need is, is similarly ludicrous and uninformed. And, and there's so many studies, many of which are in the baby book, that debunk that, that it's really, I mean, anybody who thinks that, it's just hardly worth the time to even examine that. Because clearly the composition of the milk is directly related, you know, we know it as far as omega-6, omega-3 ratios, we know it as far as mineral composition, we know it as far as phytonutrient composition. It's obviously clearly reflected in the uh, health, well-being, and in particularly the diet of the mother. I mean, the baby will survive almost without, you know, no matter what the mother does but not be healthy. So that's just extremely uninformed, in my opinion. You know, as far as um, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, again, you know, like I say, knowing the work of Price is like having the answers to the test. So which is best? I mean, obviously breastfeeding is best. And insofar as possible, one should make every attempt 
including uh, treating the mother for any sicknesses that get in the way or there are certain teas and certain other foods that were traditionally eaten to um, stimulate breast milk, et cetera, et cetera. So one should always do that. And yeah, it's interesting because we, meaning, meaning mostly Sally, has gotten a fair amount of criticism. We, we get criticism on both sides. One is how can you dare put a, a non-breastfeeding formula in a, in a baby book, a holistic baby book? And the other side is, is we're too, I don't know what it is, moralistic about it's okay to, if you don't want to, if you can't nurse, it's okay to do the formula. So we, we sort of get it from both sides. The, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, no matter what I or anybody thinks about that breast is best and a healthy, well-nourished mother's breast milk is clearly the choice and by far the best. Nobody disputes that who has any, you know, really sense about it. There are certain times in certain situations, you know, mother could die or, you know, all kinds of things can happen. Mother has to go back to work or you know, grandparents have to take over, that it seemed appropriate to at least write a formula that one could use in that in the in those events. So that's what we did. And in my practice, you know, it doesn't come up much, but I have had an occasional family. I can remember one who, uh, for whatever reason, they adopted two children. And both children from basically day one were raised on the raw milk formula and two of the healthiest children that I've had in my practice. So from that point of view, I was glad that we wrote that formula, we meaning Sally, and that Sally helped make those ingredients available, which she did. And so it worked. And nobody would say that it's the first choice. But, you know, life is, you have to be practical. So that's why we put it. Well, and maybe you could take a moment to, because I think even the idea of homemade formula to me was a new one. Um, I didn't really know you could do that. And if, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the homemade formula in the book is different to, say, the formula you buy on the shelf. Uh, I mean, the main difference is the processing. Uh, you take, you know, fresh, whole, raw milk, uh, which if it's especially from a certified dairy or somewhere where you know and has been, you know, tested bacteriologically, it's safe. It has all kinds of enzymes, proteins, cofactors that are not present in heat-sterilized milk, including the good bacteria. So it's a completely different product. And you know, you only see negative things coming from drinking pasteurized milk. I, 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 so many people are allergic to it. The enzymes that need it are needed for digestion. You know, there's an enzyme in milk called lactase, which helps digest the lactose. If you heat it, the lactase goes away. So you end up with undigestible milk, which then makes you sick. And I never encourage people to drink pasteurized milk uh, unless it's then cultured, which then makes it mostly okay. So you can do yogurt and you can use pasteurized milk and make it cultured uh, into yogurt. So that's okay. But the main difference is, you know, you take this basically dead, undigestible milk, you mix it with synthetic vitamins, which are not real vitamins, and we call that food for babies, and the babies get sick. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really important point also because um, because I think it's good to provide those options, and I think it's really good to distinguish between um, uh, like a homemade formula made with real food ingredients versus kind of the formula that's made in a, a lab and how those things could be different. Right. I mean, it's interesting, you know, if, if to most adults, 
not all adults because some don't know and don't care, but if you said to, you know, healthy eating adults who eat organic foods, so here, here's your food. It's basically pasteurized milk and some vitamins from a, from a lab. How do you, what do you, what do you think of that? They wouldn't eat it. And yet they feed their babies that. Hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I always thought it was interesting because, I mean, the baby has to eat the formula for almost a year in some degree. So it's, if you're, yeah, I, I, I yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting, an interesting topic. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to ask you about um, is I think it's really interesting just the way that you're talking about illness because, you know, many women struggle with all kinds of different fertility challenges and different um different issues that then kind of interplay into fertility. And you talked about autoimmune disease. And I thought of, you know, all the women that suffer with Crohn's disease or irritable bowel, thyroid conditions are are just kind of rampant. And so many women are struggling with these types of issues. And those types of issues kind of interfere with their fertility. And the solution that they receive from doctors is often just like you said, kind of just a pill, or, you know, replace the thyroid hormone or, um, just some sort of suppressant and the, the root cause isn't being addressed. Um, do you have any thoughts on why there's such a disconnect and uh, between actually finding a solution, why medicine doesn't even try to find the cure and just kind of accept that these conditions are chronic and incurable and just kind of let everyone treadle on without ever having the hope of getting better? I mean, that's a big question, and you. So, I, and all I would have is my opinion, and I, also my experience. You know, I'm trained as a medical doctor too, and so I went through it. They have a very superficial philosophy, uh, which is not surprising because everything else in this country is also very superficial. I could give you examples from the world of finance and politics, environmentalism the law, you know, lawyers are not about justice, they're about law, which is different. Doctors are not about healing, they're about suppressing symptoms, which is different. Why is that? I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons. They're poorly educated and overschooled, and there's business reasons. It's more lucrative to treat somebody from for asthma every day rather than figure out a way that our society works, that everybody's needs get met and nobody has asthma. And there's all kind of reasons in between. Most doctors are not intellectually curious enough to go on their own and figure these things out uh, or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I was shocked in medical school as to how uncurious, if that's the word, and superficial the whole thing was. I mean, shocked in a way. By then I was already used to it, so I wasn't surprised really. But that's just the way our culture is. Well, and then the solution. So for any women who are listening to the podcast who are struggling with some sort of chronic illness or struggling with fertility challenges, um, and, you know, they're going to their physician, but the physician isn't really looking at the root cause, is the solution to find a naturopathic doctor? Um, where do where do we go to find somebody who's going to actually look at us, you know, as a whole human being and actually try to help us find what's causing these problems? Well, I could I I, I the two things that ca- came into my head when you said that. Uh, one is I have a a good friend who's a doctor who. Whenever he gives his talks, he starts by usually it's to holistically minded people. So he starts, the first thing he says is, half of what I do is protect people from conventional doctors. And of course, everybody laughs. And then when they're done laughing, he says, and the other half is protect them from alternative doctors. And usually people don't laugh so much because a lot of them are alternative doctors. Um, but 
that's why if somebody asked me, so is the, is the solution to go to a naturopath or a homeopath or something like that, I'm not so sure. It all depends. It could be anybody depending on their experience and how they think. And I would admit uh, that it's hard to find people like that. I mean, frankly, that's why I've written what I have. And, you know, I guess to put in a plug, I would encourage people to go to my website, which is fourfoldhealing.com. And I'm actually putting out a series of books on on treating autoimmune disease and treating uh, how to eat vegetables, you know, what the composition of a diet is. I'm writing a book on heart issues, so hopefully they can, uh, at least you can get a start. But it's very difficult for me to refer to generic people because my experience is most of them don't, don't get it either, at least in the way that I say which is which is the other thing that came up when you said that I have a now about four and a half year old grandson and recently I asked him something and he said to me uh, good yuck grandpa <laughs> so, so if you're thinking about where to go uh, it's just good luck because well is there a way <laughs> hard thing. I, I, I see your point, though, because if you're going to somebody, um, I always think that way in terms of there's always excellent people in their profession and there's always less than excellent people. Um, and it, it sounds like what you're saying is it, it's more relevant, the perspective that that person is coming from and how they view illness. How, that is more important in terms of how they're going to treat you. Is that, does that yeah. sound right? <laughs> and they have to have the experience and the insight, it, you know, we are overschooled and undereducated. And it doesn't matter if it's medical school or naturopath school. There, there's very few wise people in this culture who can impart good training on any younger people. So it doesn't matter what, what they call themselves. That's just, I mean, obviously these are my opinions. That's how I see it. So... You, the the consumer, the patient, has to do some of this himself or herself. And that's why, you know, I'm putting my two cents in, not that I know everything or anything, but I have a certain perspective. I mean, I believe in my perspective. People can choose for themselves. And I lay out how you can go about dealing with these things. Uh, that's not the same, but at least it's my contribution to <laughs> the uh, health of the American people, I guess. Well, it's an important one. Uh, so to, to bring our interview to a close today, I have a few questions just uh, that I'd like to ask at the end. And so the first one is, um, and it's, you know, it's it's a broad one, but you can pick, you can take it however you want to. What would you say is the most important thing that a woman should know when she's trying to get pregnant? She should know whether she has a good relationship with her prospective father. Okay. Care to elaborate on that a bit? That would be the first time I've had that answer. Well, as anybody who's ended up uh, with children and divorce, that's one of the worst kind of nightmares for everybody involved. And uh, so it's, it's not easy to know that, but one should, uh, it's, it's fine to get married and have a relationship with whoever you want. But if you're going to have children, you better think about it. And so I would encourage everybody to really Think about it and maybe even get some second opinions from trusted friends. Like, do you think if somebody who you really trust their opinion, do you think we're really a good match? Which is very hard for people to hear if they think they're, quote, in love. But I can tell you, uh, you can, uh, other people can often look at two people, even people who are married, and say, you may know what I'm talking about here. 
There's no way these two people are going to make it. There's no way. And if you're in that boat, I would think twice and maybe three times and maybe 103 times before you start having children. Mm. I think that's a hard one. I think that's a hard one to swallow because, because, you know. Totally. There's all these other factors. There's like time and I'm this old and, you know, so. Yeah, too bad. You want to have children and you're going to have trouble with your relationship. You bet that you're going to have trouble. Believe me or believe somebody who's been through it. Okay, well, second, last question. What would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you would like to see corrected? Well, I guess that, I don't know if it's a myth, because I don't know if anybody believes it, but if you, if somebody has infertility, they're not healthy. Uh, And it could be a personal thing, meaning you're not healthy, or it could be because there's, you know, you know, women, everybody now has all kind of extra estrogens in their tissue from all the poisoning and pollution in our environment, men and women. And so the idea that, oh, you're perfectly fine, you're just infertile, I mean, that's nonsense. If you're infertile, you're not fine. So if you're infertile, you need to do something to get yourself to be healthier. By definition, the idea that there's nothing wrong with you, <laughs> I mean, it's, amazing. it's like, it's like going, going to a doctor and you say, I can't have a bowel movement. And he says, that's ah, fine. Some people have bowel movement, some people don't. It's not true. I love that you said that because it really highlights that a healthy body is a fertile body and a fertile body, like having the ability to, to be fertile is a part of a fu- functioning body. Yeah, so normal. I just like the way that you said that and the metaphor that you use with the bowel movement because it just highlights it like, yeah, someone would think it's a problem if you can't, you know, go to the bathroom. But then why do we think that it's why do we think differently of fertility? I love that. Okay, and last question of the day. So for a woman who's listening who is currently on some sort of hormonal contraceptive um, and she doesn't want to get pregnant now, but she's thinking about getting pregnant maybe in the next two to three years, what advice, if any, would you give to her? Stop taking hormones and figure out some other way to do it. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Dr. Cowan, thank you so much for being here today, for taking time out of your day to share your knowledge and wisdom with the listeners. I'm excited to share this interview with all of my listeners. I think that they'll get so much from it. Um, So I know you mentioned your website, fourfoldhealing.com. Was there any other information about yourself that you wanted to share in case any of the listeners wanted to learn more about you um, or get into contact with you? Uh. Only that, I, like I say, I do have a number of books coming out, and I do have a whole business venture around food coming out, but none of that is finished product yet, and so if people are interested, they can just follow it on the website, and they'll hear what they need to, uh, they'll know what they need to know. Okay, and I'll definitely link to the two books that are out, um, so The Fourfold Path to Healing, and the Nourishing Traditions book of Baby and Child Care. So I'll have those two links in the podcast show notes for anyone who's wanting to find out more information. And so thank you so much for your time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, I would love it if you would share it with a friend. I would also love to hear your thoughts on today's episode, so head over to the show notes page and let me know what you found most helpful from today's show. So you'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 70, so the number 70. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash fertilityfridays with an S, 
on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And if you enjoyed what you heard today and you're wanting to learn a little bit more about the fertility awareness method, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the Fertility Friday Fertility Awareness Facebook group. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. Of course, leave an honest review. I really do appreciate you taking the time to let me know how I'm doing. And if you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. I love hearing from you. And so I appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast today. So whether you're on the go, whether you're um, doing chores or uh, driving in your car, thank you for letting me be a part of your day. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.